I started my first business when I was 16 years old. I definitely didn't have all the answers, but what I did have was a drive and a passion for success. Now, where I'm at today is very different than where I was at there, but I had a lot of learning experiences and a lot of them came along this journey. Some great, some scary, some horrible, as you can probably imagine, but the bottom line is, it's my journey. So let me tell you a little bit about that. I'm Chris Noggle, and again, my job is to teach you how to become the bank. When I was young, I grew up in a lower, lower middle class family. My dad was an alcoholic. My mom had to raise me. It was a, it was a huge struggle for her. Now I know not, that's not the norm for all of you, but that was my norm. And I'll never forget growing up, my mother always, because she couldn't buy things. We didn't have the money to buy me the things that I wanted. She always taught me to dream. So as a kid, I would always draw pictures of the things I wanted. I even remember in school, there was a skateboard that I wanted and I would just fixate and draw pictures that I saw in the magazines. Well, whether it was skateboards or BMX bikes or dirt bikes, whatever it was, that's how I articulated them. And these dreams that I would come up with and these things that I wanted became so real that I vividly remember having dreams, true dreams at night of me actually riding the skateboard or riding the dirt bike. That's how real it became. Now, I was just a young kid. My gosh, I might've been seven years old with the skateboarder eight. I mean, and to think back to that, you know, one of the things I know now is if you dream it and you believe it, you can achieve it. That's from Napoleon Hill. But back then that was just, that was life. That's all I knew. Now, even though that wasn't the norm, I always wanted more as a kid. And growing up in a household, when my mom needed something, what she would do is save her spare change in a little jar. And I would watch the process of her do this. And the that jar would fill up. And then when the time was right, my mom would ask me to help her count and we'd roll change. I know many of you probably don't even know what that's like, but that's what we did. And then when she saved enough, she bought what she wanted. And to me, that experience and watching that happen over time was exciting. So my mom got me this little black box. I still have it. I wish I had it on me right now. A little slide top. And she said, you need to start saving money for the things that you want to buy. There's a lot of things I wanted, but at that time it was a KX 125. I had been fixating on this stupid dirt bike forever, drawing pictures, having those dreams. And I started saving. I did odds and ends jobs. I'd shovel the neighbor's driveway. I'd mow lawns. I'd go around and pick up leaves in the fall, whatever I could. Across the street, my neighbor had a horse farm. So I'd go over there and clean the stalls. And I'd get a little money here, there, and I would give it all to my mom and she put it in this box. I'll never forget the day and my mom said, hey, Chris, do you wanna go look at that dirt bike? That was like the greatest day ever for me. So we went to this place called Hebler's that sold these dirt bikes and I test drove two, an RM and a KX. And after I got done with it, I thought, you know, that was the best day of my life. I got to ride the dirt bike I've always wanted. And I just thought we were gonna go home and my mother says to me, she says, would you like that dirt bike? I, I was so confused, but of course, I'm a kid. I'm like, yeah, I want the dirt bike. And she says, well, let's buy it and you can take it home today. See, what I didn't realize, because I wasn't keeping track of it, but I had saved enough money to buy that dirt bike. Folks, I, I can't even explain the feeling I felt when she told me that. The only thing I can think of is pride and joy. And we took it home and that was the first real experience. But that doesn't explain the magnitude of what that lesson taught my mom, literally, taught me what today I know is the first law of wealth, which is saving 10% of the money you make. Now I may not have been saving 10%, but I was saving and I was delaying instant gratification. And that was not because I wanted to delay instant gratification, it was just because that was just the way it was. The whole rest of my upbringing was the same. When I wanted something, I fixated on it. I, I used to go fishing with my dad. Like he, that's the one thing he really taught me is fishing and I loved it. But I'd always have to go to a pond and I didn't always have access to go to a pond to fish. So I didn't get to fish as much as I wanted. I had this idea that why don't I just dig a hole in the backyard and I'll just make my own darn pond. I mean, when you're a kid, there's no boundary to what your creativity can be. Your dreams are as big as they want to be until life tries to knock them down, tell you, you can't do this and you can't do that because everybody's trying to get you to conform to their failed reality. But when I was a kid, I didn't have that conformity coming at me. It was just whatever I wanted, I did. I grabbed a shovel because my mom said, yeah, go out and dig it. And I went and I started digging in the far right corner of my yard and I hit bedrock. And I remember I kept trying to find a way around the bedrock and I said, mom, I, I can't get past the rock. She said, Chris, you're, you're doing it wrong. You gotta find a place where the water lays, like where there's water after the snow melts. I live in Buffalo, New York. We have no lack of snow. And I remember at the tail end of our yard, we had about a two acre lot. 
there was this low spot and every spring there was a big, almost like mini pond back there, but it always dried up. So I got this idea, I started digging the pond there. All summer long, I dug and I dug and I just kept digging this thing and I literally dug a pond. There's a YouTube video up on here that shows that pond. Now, the funniest part is, is you know, I dug this hole and I, when it filled up, because it was spring, it, it, it basically had water. And I went up the street, I caught some bass and some sunfish and I put them in there and I would sit out there for hours casting into my pond that I did. I never caught a fish. And yes, the pond did dry up and animals probably got to enjoy the fish that I caught, but it was the act of doing it that was so exciting. Fast forward to the early 2000s. The way I grew up, without having money led me to want a lot because I always wanted more. So I accomplished two major goals by the time I was in my, my late teens, early 20s. One of them was I accomplished the goal of becoming a pro snowboarder. It was something I began to fixate on much after the, the fish pond, but I, I began fixating on the idea of becoming a pro snowboarder. I became a pro snowboarder, but along with that, I had started my first company at the age of 16. And that was not because I wanted to be an entrepreneur, not because I wanted to make a bunch of money, but because I quit my job because I was treated so poorly at the restaurant I worked at that when I came home, I needed a plan B. I needed an excuse to tell mom why I quit. And I told her, well, mom, I'm gonna start a clothing line in the basement. Can I convert part of the basement into my office? And I did just that. We drywalled it all up and got it nice. And that was the headquarters for my company at the age of 16 called Fat Clothing Company, P-H-A-T. And I would make shirts with my art teacher, Mr. Mahalski. After school, every day we'd print the shirts. I would then take them in my backpack and sell them in school. Friends would see this and they'd be like, oh, I got this cool idea for a shirt. I would take their drawing. I would make it a shirt that was a fat clothing shirt. Then they would help me sell them because they were proud of it. So now instead of having one salesperson, me, I had two and that continued on. Well, it even got to the point where after some time, I started selling my clothes on the road to snowboard and skateboard shops that I had stopped at that were putting snowboard contests on that I was riding in. And I got this second idea. So about 17 years old and I had seen all these shop owners who had the ultimate freedom. I'd never seen this before. I remember being in this one shop in Canadagua, and it was a shop that I sold my clothes to, and, and the guy said, hey, do you wanna go riding, snowboarding? And I'm like, yeah, when do you off work? He's like, let's go right now. To me, it was like, Phew. like this guy can just leave work anytime he wants to go snowboard? Like, what? So the idea was formed, like I needed my own shop. I mean, I had the fat clothing company, and I was the man, so I got the idea for fat man board shops. So I was selling my shirts at this flea market every weekend, and the guy that I kind of rented a booth with or actually sold his stuff to be able to sell mine, I, that was my rent, his time, he had the idea of doing a shop too. So we came together and we opened the store, Fat Man Board Shops. But see, it didn't just open, because we needed $70,000. So I'm 17 years old, I need $70,000 to open this dream shop called Fat Man Board Shops. Where am I gonna get that? So I did what any other 17 year old would do. I went around to all the people in your family that have money or you think have money. And I asked them, can I borrow 70 grand? And I heard things like, no, absolutely not. You're an idiot. This isn't gonna work. You're gonna fail. You're gonna shoot your eye out, kid. You know, all that kind of stuff. My father was one of them that told me that. And then he went on to say, hey, come over to the factory and I'll get you a job as if like my destiny was gonna be your destiny, dad. I, I don't wanna work at a factory. I have different ambitions, different goals. See again, people in your lives will try to get you to conform to what they know. It's not that they're trying to do that out of, out of you know, malice or out of any ill will, it's just all they know. But when you conform to somebody else's failed realities, their failed dreams and their failed life, not entirely, but you get the drift. You literally conform to a life that you weren't meant to do. My life wasn't meant to work at a factory like my father. My life was to go out and create things. So my mother saw all this happening, saw my dream almost die. I remember her saying to me, well, what is it gonna take to do this? She had no money. So she was just trying to edge me on and keep me going. And I said, mom, I went to this bank and I, I had my business plan because I learned how to write a business plan. And they said, we'll give you an SBA back loan kid, but we need collateral. I didn't even know what collateral was. You know, when they told me it's something to back the loan, I'm like, oh, I got a 1986 Buick Skyhawk, I got a KX125, and I got an awesome baseball card collection. Yeah, well, that wasn't what they were looking for. So I told my mom that they needed collateral. By chance, my mom, well, our house, I should say, not just my mom's house, the house she got in the divorce was worth $72,000. That's how much equity she had in it. So my mom gave me my start, really. It's almost brings tears. I'm gonna try to hold it together. But she put her house on the line so that I could get this loan, so I could chase my dream. My mother literally gave me 
that opportunity. Now that is the ultimate act of giving because think about it, my mother, a woman who had to save her spare change to buy a lawnmower, just put the only asset, the biggest asset she has in her life on the line for her punk 17 year old kid to chase his dream. I wouldn't suggest she did that by today's standards, but she did and that's how I got my start. And I ran those stores successfully all the way, you know, going well, open multiple locations. And then all of a sudden, I remember one day I'm driving down the thruway and on the radio, I had heard that a plane hit the towers. You remember this, this was effectively 9-11, but I didn't know it. And after 9-11 happened, the recession kicked in. Now, I'd never seen a recession. I want to parallel this to today. Anybody that's 38 years old or younger has never seen a recession that would impact their lives. So now back to me. Okay, I'm in my early 20s. I'd never seen a recession until this dot-com crash. What I didn't realize is that a recession brings everything down. It's like the tide. All When the tide goes down, all boats go down. Well, my business sales dropped about 30%. I was highly leveraged. I was on my third location and I needed to get a job. So what I did is what every other 20-some-year-old would do. You go to Little Caesars and you ask them if they're hiring delivery drivers. I mean, hey, that's going to pay for the, the truck you know, that I had. They weren't hiring. Since when does Little Caesars not need delivery drivers? Well, that was the moment, but I think it was the universe telling me that wasn't my path. So I put my resume out. My resume was nothing special. Two years of community college, business owner, and I never put a suit on in my life. And you know who reaches out to me? Wall Street companies. So all of a sudden, now I'm going to an interview at a Wall Street firm. I have no idea what to say. I've never bought a stock in my life. Actually, uh, I had watched my mom buy a mutual fund through a family friend that we had. That was the only exposure I ever had to any financial product. I interviewed the guy, throws the keys down on the table and says, if you work for this firm, you'll have this car. I think it was a Porsche or something. I'm like, sign me up. How do I, how do I start? Where, where do I sign? And I ended up working there and quitting and going to another firm, but that was my start in Wall Street. This is a very strange time for me because remember, I'm a skateboard snowboarder. I never put a suit on. I wore hoodies and beanies. And now I got to wear blue, gray, and black suits every single day I go to work. It messes with your mind. You can't just pivot like that just easily. Every day I felt foreign. I didn't even feel like I was in my own skin. So here's what I did. I went to my show, my store that I still had and we sold this company called Volcom. I ordered Volcom suits. You probably didn't even know Volcom made suits, but they did. And I found them. And by putting a suit on that was made by a snowboard skateboard manufacturer was just enough to get my mind in the right place to say, this is okay. I think I can do this. When I was in the bullpen sitting there and pounding the phones to make these guys in the outside you know, offices more and more money, I wanted one of those offices. And I remember looking at it and saying, how do I get one of those? And I talked to a few of them and they told me the path. And I'm like, you know what? These guys, they have these big offices, make millions of dollars. They show up late. They show up about 8.30, 9 o'clock. Then when they show up 8.39, they leave for lunch for two hours. When they leave for lunch for two hours, about 4.35 o'clock, they're gone for the day. And I just said to myself, you know what? If I want one of those offices, all I got to do is what they're unwilling to do. I showed up at seven. I pounded the phone through lunch. I didn't go out for lunch. And when 4.35 came and nobody was in that office, guess where I was? Out seeing the clients that I talked to on the lunch break. And very quickly, I became one of the top advisors. Matter of fact, I skyrocketed. My first year, I made $74,000, more money than I'd ever made. By today's standards, that might not be a lot, but we're talking 2003. For a 23-year-old, that was a lot of money. And then I made over 100 the next year and it just went north. I had flipped a couple of houses, one in 06, one in 07. They didn't go great, but I got the, the taste of that. And in 2008, my lease came due at my biggest store, okay, my fat man shop. And I said, why am I going to pay an increased rent to this guy when I can buy this dilapidated building? There was a paint store that was two buildings down for sale. I'll buy that. I'll convert it into a three unit strip mall and I'll have my tenants pay me rent. Brilliant idea. You heard what year I did that, right? 2008. You would think that being an advisor, I would have saw the storm coming, the Great Recession, but I didn't. And it hit me like a Mack truck. It's full steam ahead. And I'll never forget the early years of that recession. I was one payment away from being able to pay these hard money lenders that gave me the money. Now, these weren't the kind of guys that you didn't pay monthly checks to, because if you didn't, I don't know if they would have just taken the property. They probably would have taken a pinky or maybe a a big toe or something, who knows? They weren't the right kind of people to borrow, but they were the only ones that would give me the money. So I took it. And I went home one night, <clears throat> my girlfriend had just moved into my house. And I remember sitting her down and I said, sweetie, I need your help. I need your help paying the mortgage. I need your help paying the utilities. And by the way, my friend Pete's gonna move into that bedroom. As if I was then gonna say, any questions? When you're backed into a corner, you make difficult decisions. And this was just the only decision I knew to make at that point. I had no one else to go to. I'd already exhausted everything I had. I thought in my mind, I think I thought I had a 50-50 shot of her sticking around. 
My friends later told me I had about a 10% shot, but I think she kind of liked me because she did stay and that's how I made it through the Great Recession and how I narrowly avoided going bankrupt. The next phase of my life from 2009 to 14 was an interesting one. I had watched everything plummet and I was smart enough to know how to invest because I read a lot of Warren Buffett books and one of the books said, the secret to making money is to buy low, sell high, and if you do that, you won't lose money. So I knew that real estate was low and I said, all right, I need to buy real estate. From 2009 to 14, I took every penny I made in Wall Street, every extra dollar I had, I leveraged my 401k, I took loans, I, I took money from my whole life policies that I had started and I put it all into real estate and I built up to 36 units. And then in 2014, I went to get my 37th property. And the same banker that had taken me out of that strip mall hard money loan, the same banker that had helped me get all these loans for these real estate says to me, we can't do this loan. You don't fit the little box. In other words, your debt to income ratio is out of whack. And I didn't quite understand the magnitude of what was going on. I said, okay, I won't do the 37. But then what they did, the bank then froze my line of credit. I was pretty much dead in the water. I didn't know that because without the line of credit, I couldn't finish the properties. Without finishing the properties, I couldn't generate rent and I couldn't afford all this overhead and it spiraled down quickly. 2014 was the hardest period of time in my life. And it was the hardest period of time in my life to date because everything that I thought I had going for me just crumbled underneath me because of one error. One error that I didn't even know I made because I thought I knew what I didn't know. You know, Will Rogers, I've read his quote, went on to say the biggest problem in America is not what we don't know. The biggest problem in America is what people think they know that just ain't. So you see, I thought I knew what wasn't so that was the problem. I was an advisor, right? I was the money guy. I thought I knew what I was doing and all of a sudden one thing and it all comes crumbling down. So bad that I had to sell our dream house that me and Larissa had bought. Larissa is the girlfriend that moved into my house who is now my fiance. It was like our dream. And now all of a sudden I didn't have enough money to keep it going so I sold that. I, and I'll never forget right when I sold it, I decided I was gonna sell all my belongings and I remember putting an ad in Craigslist to sell my bedroom set. I don't know if you guys have ever been at this low of a point, but it's the point where you're sitting there and you watch these strangers walk into the house that you no longer are gonna have and they walk out with your bedroom set. That was the magnitude of that. So you can see folks, my story is one where I've had money and I've lost it. I've had money and I've lost it again. Each one of those losses creating a new learning experience because of failure. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you and say, oh yeah, every time I was at the bottom, I was like, oh, this is great, I'm learning. No, I wanted to quit. I wanted to throw the freaking towel and I didn't wanna face the music. My mother was in my ear saying, why can't you just be happy? Why can't you just be content? You make okay money at the firm. Why don't you just go deeper into that? And I started actually believing this. And saying, yeah, mom, maybe I should. Now remember, my mom's the one that watched and, and helped me with my dream, but my mom saw me crumbling and she just didn't like that. So I almost gave up. But I don't know, something in me just said, no, I got a postcard in the mail. And I read it and it was to come to this three day seminar to learn how to flip houses. And I know exactly what you're thinking, dude, don't you ever learn? But if I flip the postcard over on the backside, it said, if you come to this three day seminar, we will give you a free iPod shuffle. Maybe some of you have gotten that. I had nothing to lose, but I had an iPod shuffle to gain. So off I went to this seminar. Boring the first day, but the second day, two guys get up there, Mike and Greg, never forget this. They start talking about money. I'm the money guy. I perk up. I'm like, whoa. But what they were talking about was the complete opposite of everything I'd ever been taught about money as a financial advisor of 14 years at that point. Everything they said was foreign to me. They talked about money. They talked about how they were getting money. They talked about how they were funding real estate deals. They talked about how being the bank was the ultimate in real estate. And I'm just like, this is, this is completely crazy. I took my credit card out of my wallet, ran to the back of that room as fast as I could, not just to get the iPod shuffle because you had to wait till the end of it. I just wanted more of what these two guys were talking about. I swiped my card for $2,900, which I didn't have came home, told Larissa, who had finally moved back into my little apartment that I had moved into after we lost the house. We didn't lose it, we had to sell it. And I told her, I just spent $2,900, we're going to this three-day training, it's gonna change our life, we're gonna learn how to flip houses, we're gonna become superstars. What do you think her reaction was? You think it was as excited as I was? She said, Chris, how much did you just spend? Don't worry about that, we're going to this event, it's gonna be awesome, blah, blah, blah. And she says, I work Fridays, I can't take a day off. I said, well, well you're gonna have to, take a vacation day or something. And she said, my dad's my manager. Like, what am I gonna say? Long story short, she ended up taking that day off. We went to that three day and it did change our life. It was the beginning of where we are today. And I'm gonna fast forward through that whole time because it was a period of learning, educating, getting coached, getting mentored, 
following and mimicking some very extremely wealthy individuals and learning everything that I didn't learn as a financial advisor. So I started questioning everything I had learned. The traditional financial method to me was a dying thing. It wasn't real because that wasn't what the wealthiest people I knew were doing now. Me and my wife went on to flip hundreds of houses, 270 and that should be 271 soon. Okay, we don't do too many flips anymore, but our goal back then was to get a TV show because we were sitting in an event watching two speakers, two TV show stars on the stage. I look over at Larissa and I said, sweetie, if we're ever gonna be on that stage, we gotta have a show. Just like that, that creative mind, that, that dream came up and I'm like, well, we're gonna create a show. It's gonna be jackass meets flipper flop. We're gonna have my skate team come into the houses as we're demoing them. We're gonna make ramps. They're gonna skate. We're gonna video this. It's gonna be sweet in the winter. I'm gonna do pulleys. I'm gonna jump up on the roof. Anyway, I'm getting excited, but that's exactly what it was. We made our first sizzle reels. We sent them off to all the networks, H, G, A, and E, and they all said no. Just like that, all this time, I'd spent 40 grand on production and video and all this stuff. and just to get a big no from all of them. They liked the idea, but it just wasn't in the square box. And I remember the square box from the bank. I'm like, damn it, I gotta figure this square box out. So I went to that Mike guy that I met and I said, Mike, do you know another producer that knows the square box HGTV wants? He did, he connected me. We did all the interviews, we got them to take us on and we made what was called, what aired as Risky Builders was our pilot that we did on HGTV in 2018. So we actually made it to the big stage. We aired with our heroes, Tarek and Christina from Flipper Flop, right next to them. We never made it on to series, which was the greatest thing, because when that door slammed shut, it opened another door to what I do today. And what I do today is help tens of thousands of people learn the truth about money, learn what I didn't learn as a financial advisor, what my entire life I was sheltered from, not because I wanted to be sheltered, but because society doesn't want you to know what these secrets are. So I teach them today. And I set people free from what I call financial slavery by teaching people like you how to become your own bank. That's my story and I'm sticking with it. So folks, if you liked that video and my story, you're gonna love this video, predicting the future of real estate. What's next? Check it out and we'll see you on the next episode.